Recording started. Work. Thank you. And we'll work on getting all of my little Heidi things up because I have learned if I put the chat up from the beginning, then I can keep track of you guys. Perfect. And we'll go ahead and start with presenting. So hello, my name is Elsie. Uh, I am from the West Kingdom for the Principality of Sanagua. And today we're going to cover a topic that really could be subtitled, the physiologic things that make ruminants cool for cooks. I'm gonna explain all that as we go. If there were words in there that you didn't understand, don't worry, we'll get to them. So as a starting place, uh, ruminants are, had, a, had a long time ago and even have today, a wide variety of uses. The, the one obviously that is most important to the attendees of this conference is gonna be the stuff that falls under the food and culinary categories in terms of meat and dairy. Other uses, included fiber. Uh, we think about making things from hair or from wool. Certainly leather was tanned and was used in a variety of ways. Uh, and in terms of some of the things that might feed back into your culinary things, we used horn, antler, and bone as portions of construction and for products and drinking vessels and that sort of thing. So those those come into play. We also, I know I have another go for them, see a cool picture of the goat that has the pack saddle. I love this photo for goat people. Um, they actually did use ruminants for draft and pack work as well. So you many of you have heard of oxen being used for plowing or for pulling carts. Uh, there was pack work done as well. For what we're covering today, we're going to focus in on the food side of things, but from a history and use of the animals in period, these other factors are important because not all of these animals were single purpose. You might have a cow that was giving calves, you were using her milk for some things, she also was broke to do some work, and then when she got to the end of the day, you went ahead and you butchered her and you used her meat and her fiber and her horn for various things. So all of those factors and the various uses are going to impact the ages that you guys might have access to these animals for meat or for dairy purposes. Other things that come into play in terms of period uses would be sport, um, hunting and fighting were common ones. We know that bullfighting was common in several areas. And uh, it, it throughout the time period, it was common in several areas. Uh, there are still ritual versions of that practice today. The, the town I live in does a recreation of uh, it's closer to 18th century bullfighting. They use Velcro tip spears. Um, so you're able to go out and see some of the maneuvers and, and see the type of cattle that they have bred for that. Hunting obviously is going to come into play with some of the more wild types of rumens, the, the deers, deer predominantly. Uh, we already mentioned that ritual can be a large part of it and sacrifice. Some animals were purpose bred for that. Other animals were, that was included just as part of it. And that may have had a culinary component to it occasionally as well the value of things could be established in terms of the value of the animal and compared to something else and used as barter or paying for things. And then we have breeding stock, which is actually really important for dairy animals because without regular pregnancy, those animals didn't have milk that could then be used for uh, dairy purposes. So what exactly constitutes a ruminant? I told you all that a large part of this class were the things that makes ruminants cool for cooks, which begs the question, what's a ruminant? Some of the common species that you might run across would be cattle, sheep, and goats. Those are ones we tend to be familiar with in the Western world from a domestication standpoint. Also yaks were important in large swaths of the world starting about the same, domesticated about the same time 
as cattle and sheep, goats were domesticated uh, quite a bit earlier. We also have the wild ruminants that come into play, uh, caribou or reindeer, depending on whether they were wild or they were domesticated animals. And then this is where I get to tell my favorite story. If we look up on this picture, uh, we get to talk about the difference between elk and moose. When you see elk or a version thereof in the Northern European manuscripts, this is the animal that they're refer referring to. In North America, we would call that a moose, uh, which is an Algonquin word for this type of animal. That happened, and this is from Dame Kenneth Hill, that happened because when the settlers first came over and were speaking with the natives, they asked about what is this, this very large deer here. And, and that was the largest deer they thought was around. So they started calling that an elk because that was their word for a large deer. And then they learned that moose were found in North America as well, but the word elk had already been used. So they took the Algonquin word rather than, than using the word with the Germanic roots. And there are many, many, many deer species found throughout the world that you can run across depending on, uh, on which portion of the world you're focusing in on and, and which time period. Okay, so fundamentally what makes a ruminant is they have a rumen, a rumen. You maybe have heard the idea that a cow has four stomachs. Uh, they do have four stomachs to an extent, or at least four distinct compartments to their, their stomach that they're used. So when a cow takes in food, there's my cursor. When a cow takes in food, it travels down the esophagus, just like it does in any other critter that's going to eat. And then it travels down into this area. And we've got the rumo, sometimes called the rumo reticulum. The rumen is a very, very large compartment in, oh, our modern cattle, it's gonna hold 25 to, I've even heard up to 40 gallons of material. Um, and this is the large fermentation vat. So the reason that we can go ahead and take cattle and feed them woody type things, and they can do the cool thing of turning it into either milk for dairy or muscle to be used as a meat purpose is because inside this rumen, they have bacteria. It is a giant fermentation bath. So hopefully all the brewers are perking up because this is so cool. Cows are the original brewers just about. They're gonna go through with their rumen bacteria and have a slurry in here that they break down. As things break down, the heavier particles fall into this reticulum area. Uh, for anyone that this is the reticulum has a honeycomb structure to it. And for anyone that's ever made tripe or trupa, that's going to be the structure that you're working from. So they go through and they go back and forth and they've got long fibrous bits of hay and grass and wood. And, you know, if you've ever had goats, whatever else they can get their lips on. Um, and that all circle circulates in here. And eventually the bacteria that are in there break things down enough where it can travel into the omasum and then it can travel into the ab omasum. And this is the closest thing to what we think of as a true stomach in monogasters. So species that only have one stomach, which would include humans. This is the area that's gonna go ahead and secrete all the enzymes and stuff to break things down. And yeah, we have, uh, Wana made a comment about just like we have bacteria in our guts, when we look at animal species, we'll talk about foregut fermenters. That's not the fact that cows have four stomachs. That's F-O-R-E. They do their fermentation at the beginning of their process. Things like rabbits and horses and chickens are hindgut fermenters. They do all their fermentation at the end of the process. Yes, Juana, but you're skipping ahead to a later slide. I'll get back to that. She asked about rennet. Uh, so that's where we go through, and this is that, that key factor. Where this comes into play from a cook perspective is that 
you're going to go through and have these various species in various areas. Where you see a difference, and you, you'll see this in the paintings where a lot of times they'll be, they actually had herds of pigs that traveled around. Pigs have a single stomach. So there's limits to the kinds of forage that they can live on and process quite as well. Just like we couldn't eat a slightly woody bit of sagebrush and turn that into anything useful, cattle can. So when we're feeding cattle, it becomes almost like we're feeding the bacteria inside them and then the bacteria feed the rest of the cow. So this actually depends a little bit on which kind of ruminant we're looking at. And so if you're starting to think about looking in images and looking at the things they're eating on, one of the key factors here is cows have a lip that actually isn't very easy for them to move. You'll notice that they don't have upper teeth, but they have this long, almost prehensile tongue. Um, they do a great job of reaching out and grabbing on and ripping food and putting things in. This is actually a sheep. It's not a particularly healthy sheep, but it was a photo that showed what I wanted. Um, they have a split here, and so they're actually, sheep and goats are able to nibble down on smaller grasses. So you'll see them being useful in places that don't have longer vegetation, whereas to have your cow be healthy, you need to have this longer vegetation. And that's going to be really important here in a minute. So we're getting excited about cheese and want to set me up for this one. So we have rennet, which comes from the abomasum. And I talked with you guys about this is the portion of the cow's stomach that goes through and secretes enzymes. So it's going to further break stuff down. Rennet specifically has two pieces to it that are important in cheese production. One is the chymosin, which is responsible for coagulating the proteins. And then the pepsin, I am told, I read briefly on a cheddar site, which I don't believe cheddaring is period, and hopefully one of the cheese people will correct me on that. Um, but but the cheddar people that I, that I looked at seemed to think that it was important for part of their aging process. Uh, many folks would have, oh, cheddaring is not period. Excellent, thank you, that's what I thought. Um, is the, does anyone know if the pepsin is important in other period cheeses? I'll let that sit for a little bit. You guys can, can drop it in the chat for me. Um, but so the chymosin you can find a couple of different places in addition to the uh, production from, from cattle and getting it from the abomasum. It can come through from plants or there are bacteria that can make other sources of it. So where does this come into play and why would a great big grown up cow need to have something that relates to milk? Well, the answer is a big old grown up cow doesn't need something re that relates to milk. Their stomach actually does something cool when they're young. So we talked about, about coming in from the esophagus and that we've got this groove that comes here when you've got a calf or something young that's not being fed fiber or grain, then that milk will run straight down into our abomasum. And so those animals are existing on a dairy product. They're, they're existing on a milk diet. And so they need to be able to digest stuff like that. And they work more like a monogaster at that point. So just like a human, um, just like a pig, any of those things that we're typically used to. Um, I did get an answer in the chat about the pepsin, that it is important for long-term aging, uh, even in non-cheddar cheeses. Thank you very much for giving me that information. So where we, we look at this is we will go through, for the folks that do want to use a cattle source rennet, you're generally looking at, or I should say ruminant source, you're looking at the young animals for that one. And you may also, I will see this occasionally in the husbandry guides, uh, and you may run across it in the cooking guides as well. There'll be little details in there where they will talk about, you know, a calf that hasn't been taken from its mother or something like that. And sometimes there are some little key factors in there where the period authors were really alluding to the idea that something was veal versus baby beef versus more involved beef. So when we're looking at a classic veal, that would be a calf that has only had access to milk. So they're still non-ruminants at that point. 
and that's going to change the well, it's going to change a little bit the the meat structure and some of those things that come in with choosing which sort of meat that you guys want to cook the same thing with very young lamb and very young goat uh, those are going to be monogastric animals still as they start to get access to grain as they start to nibble on grass those factors will cause them to get open up this groove, start to have things in their rumen, they'll get the bacteria going, and then they'll have that digestive tract that we talk about. And then you start to get an animal that's a little more beefy, goaty, sheepy. Um, when we talk about lamb from a modern perspective, uh, a market lamb type animal or what you guys are used to getting, those are animals that are full fed on grass. They're just younger animals that are going to market ages. So are we, does anyone have any more questions on pepsin before I move along or on rennet? Excellent. So we're gonna talk a little bit. I think these are really cool pictures. Thankfully, the rest of you probably aren't eating right now. So we're gonna talk about the udder, for, which is important for those of you that do uh, cheese or butter or any kind of milk work. So this is where your building block comes from. On a simple basis, you know, all, all mammary glands look more or less the same on the inside, at least on a cellular level. You have the production of your materials are up in this dense area. And then there are a series of collecting ducts that come down. There can be a large area here, the cistern, and then it comes down through. So you get that classic image of going through and milking an animal. And this is going to be true of any of the dairy animals that we have access to or that they had access to. Uh, this is, we do see some differences in terms of modern genetics. We have selected for dairy specific animals, and you'll even find that with uh, you know, if you're able to get your hands on some sheep milk, that's going to be from a dairy specific breed, even, you know, buffalo milk for making mozzarella, that is a dairy specific uh, buffalo. So, but you can see the structure. This is basically the same idea as here. Different species, all period food is one, yummy wanna. Different species are going to have slightly different structures um, in terms of two, two teeth versus four teats, and you'll see that variation. Uh, what you will see that's really important with utter anatomy and the development of food animals and the development of dairy animals specifically is pregnancy is crucial. They will go through and um, bag up is the term. You start to see the development of the udder in the late sta latest stages of pregnancy. And from there, you will have a, uh, there we go, I'm gonna mute that. Uh, you'll start to see that, that develop in the latest stages of pregnancy and you will see the milk production start. And as long as the dam is nursing offspring or you go through and strip out, they, she will continue to produce milk up to a point. Um, there has been quite a deal quite a bit of modern selection in our modern dairy and voila. There has been quite a lot of applied selection in our modern dairy animals where we've gone through and we've selected not only for udder size, but we've, and confirmation, the way the udder's built, but we've selected for uh, going through and making sure that we um, have a long time period that they continue to give that milk to us. So we go through, if you're, if you're breeding modern dairy cattle, their year, they don't respond to the seasonality quite the same way that uh, cattle did once upon a time to day length. Um, so for synchronizing modern dairy cattle, they run them on, I believe it's about a 14 month year now. That's what it was when I was in school. Uh, I had a question in the chat about strip out. So the idea of stripping out is getting all of the milk out of the udder. You want to be really careful. It's easy for udders to become inflamed uh, if they're not taken care of properly. So 
One, you stripping out would be getting all the milk out. In the case where you have inflammation or infection like mastitis, you can also in moderate in moderate cases of that, you can actually strip that out and you can clean out some of the uh, inflammatory material and get the udder back to proper health. It is possible for a, uh, for a dam who has had uh, bad mastitis, she may lose part of her udder. So she'll only have one side that's still functional. Um, and you'll, you'll see occasionally, you'll see references to that. I don't know I haven't looked into the, the period farming literature as much on that one on the veterinary side, um, but I, th um, I think there are some references to mastitis in the veterinary literature. I'd need to dig into that one a little bit further to be absolutely certain on that. Um, so we want to we wanna get our cow all the way stripped out or, or you or dough, whatever we're working with. And then we send that milk off to the cheesemakers and they do awesome things with cheese and butter. One of the things that comes into play and is always a question when we talk about developing dairy animals, we have already talked about, we wanna select for udder size. We wanna select for longevity of, produce, of milk production. One of the other things that will come in is butter fat, you know, which is important and protein honestly as well, which is important both for uh, butter production and cheese production, as opposed to fluid milk. A lot of what we're seeing in our modern animals has been genetic selection for those sorts of things. There are also a few factors and things that we know farmers can do modernly, so we know it works with the physiology in terms of special feeding and getting the cattle on the right forage. For example, longer fiber length is associated with better uh, higher, slightly higher butter fat production in modern dairy cattle. So I suspect there is some period, a period analog there. I don't know whether or not the folks in period had picked up on that. Um, the physiology tends to hold up over the years, the knowledge of the people may or may not in that time period. But so if you guys run across references that talk about, as you guys are looking at stuff, if you guys run across references where they're talking about feeding the cattle for better dairy production, let me know. That's cool. I would love to track that sort of thing down. So, excellent. Um, which gets us down to some of the options and sorts of things that we have out there. So we've, we've got all the various bits and pieces of these critters that can be used in their entirety. Um, I tried to, Oh, excellent, Evelyn, I'd love those references. Uh, I tried to go through and cover the obvious ones, but if you guys have some questions and specific milk products or meat products that you've run, run across in your things, I would love to actually take some questions from the floor and go through and see if we can kind of match my knowledge of physiology with the sorts of things that you guys have come across. So feel free to pop up with a raised hand or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. So some of uh, some of the people that I know mundanely raising animals and uh, mostly goats, of course, um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, they were um, uh, breeding for stronger medial, I think it's medial, ligaments in the udder, because uh, they were finding that they were having structural issues occur um, in certain bloodlines. Is that yeah. something that also happened back then? I mean, I, I don't really know. This may not be the right not question. Not <laughs> Okay. No, I think a perfectly reasonable question as far as I'm concerned. Um, not that I've run across and, and I'll, I, you know, I, I'm much more, most of my, my research is much more extensive on the horse literature. Mm -hmm. um, but the bits and pieces I've run, I haven't run across it. I know in, <sighs> it's certainly important in terms of ongoing. Are your friends, at, are they breeding? Are they hand milking or are they machine milking? They're doing both actually. Um... 
they it's like smaller herds this one one woman she's got a smaller herd of like nine goats and she had two that had ligament issues um and she was hand milking and then the breeder that she got half of her goats from um they were running a herd of about 60 and that was machine milked and she had a certain category like a certain number that she would set aside and just dry up and keep dry and they just lived happy happy lives so yeah. I, I suspect there are a couple of things that come into play. One, utter confirmation is tremendously important when you're doing machine milking because a poorly conformed udder, it's difficult to get it completely cleaned out. Mm -hmm. And then you'll wind up with higher rates of mastitis and then you have a less productive animal. So I think that's probably one component. Um, the other thing that, that you may see with that, particularly within small flocks, is that they don't have another use for that doe who has a poorly conformed udder and only lasts for a season or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a little more flexibility in the, the period reading that I've done so far and I've been able to come across, there's a little more flexibility in, oh, well, if she doesn't work, then we'll go ahead and uh, we will go ahead and eat her basically. And, and that's gonna do two things. One, they're gonna accidentally select for udder confirmation that way anyway because the does that they keep that have good udder conformation are gonna be the ones who are able to kid out more. Mm -hmm. The ones who have poor udder conformation, they're gonna stop breeding. So I haven't run across anything that specifically says, yes, that's exactly what they did, but I could totally believe that that would be a plausible thing to select for. Okay. Ones to breed and ones to send to freezer camp. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry. So Flora, I also had a Nigerian dwarf. They're the best. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question yeah. on, and, on is on um, why um, goat and sheep milk is less of a problem for lactose intolerant people. Elsie, do, uh, do you know the science of why that is the case? Or Evelyn, do you know? I my assumption would be that it's lower in in uh, lactose, but I don't know that for certain. Yeah, and as long as it's not a true dairy allergy, generally you can try a different breed's milk and be have better success. And it's also cheeses that are aged longer, I believe, because there's less there's lactose less. as the aging process sugars get consumed by the happy little yep. yeah. cheese microbes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and even within, I think the, the best descriptor, my daughter talks about she has a lactose limit. So there's, there's a certain amount, she has a threshold. And below that threshold, she's great. And, and things that are aged cheeses, she does better with versus other things, but she's not a completely lactose intolerant sort of person. And so there seems to be some variability within the folks about how much lactose they can tolerate or not. So that, that might be the other factor that comes into play. Yes. Yeah, and for, there's a, a thing in the, the uh, a comment about being allergic to casein. And that's the thing is when you start to look at, so allergies versus intolerances are a little bit different. Uh, the intolerance is your lack, you're lacking the enzymes. And so what happens is you wind up with too many of the sugars going into the portion of your gut that's, that is capable of doing some fermentation and you wind up with too much fermentation and problems from there. If you have an allergy, um, which is often in response to specific proteins, that will go through and set up basically a hay fever in your gut um, where you can't do much about it. And so for the, the folks that deal with that, then it's much, much, much more difficult. So if you have an intolerance, if you do something to change the, your microflora in your gut, can you alleviate that problem? It probably, it likely depends on how bad the intolerance is. So you're still not, you're still lacking the enzyme that breaks down the sugar. Um, if you were able to change over your microflora to something that didn't digest the sugar at all, then you'd be fine. Uh, but that's extremely difficult to do. I suspect the difference 
for those who are lacking in uh, lactase, I suspect the difference in threshold levels is probably partially related to their personal bacteria. Uh, for animals that are hind gut fermenters, they start picking that up actually at birth. They pick it up from their mothers and from their environment around them. There are some things you can do to go through and change that. I like gut health, sorry, you pushed a button. Um, but there are some things you can go through to change that, but, but there are limitations as well. So. So I, the link on the link on the breeds, I, I have a question on that because for most other animal species that, that I've looked at it, breeds is a Victorian concept. Most of the, and I haven't looked at it for the ruminants, but, but typically type is more commonly what they're looking for, whether we're talking about horses, dogs, or chickens. Um, they're looking more for a type than for a breed where I caution people sometimes when they're looking at the university animal science resources is the scientists that are looking at those things don't always have the grounding in the history. And so sometimes the, the, it's, it's that bad Victorian filter can occasionally come in and mess with your research. So sometimes you have to start from that, that place and that resource that's there and then you have to apply a historian's filter over it because when I'm in animal scientist mode, I have completely different conversations about this than when I'm in historian mode. Um, so, so always just be aware of that bias that's in those resources. So. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Is that your new puppy? No, that's somebody else's uh, mic. Here, we'll go ahead and use that one. Must be Gwen's puppies. I think so. We muted him. It's all good. Now, mine was, mine has decided that barking at the horses in the evening is good. We're going to work on that one. So. If people are interested, I can go blah about milking uh, water buffaloes. But many, oh, people have, cool. many people have already heard that blah. So I don't know if there's an interest. I have not heard that. Okay. Um, water buffaloes, which we all know are the source of the marvelous mozzarella um, and burrata and good things like that. Um, unlike other critters that get milked, um, water buffaloes uh, udders retract um, this, like, you know, Got guys, when they get cold, things go back inside because it's cold. Well, water buffalo do the same thing because otherwise their teats would be in the swampy water and get all yucky and make their baby sick. So this is why they evolved that, that reaction. So water buffalo have to be happy to lower their udders so that you can milk them, which is why um, the one water buffalo dairy I have been to, they, from a young age, socialize the beasts to people. They, you know, when you come and visit them, they will put you in, after they give you the tour of the place, they'll put you in the pen with the baby water buffalo so you can pet them and brush them. And they're like giant dogs. They will roll over and like, rub my belly. Um, and <laughs> they're just funny little things. Well, not so little, but... It's just a, a neat thing that they have to be, that they socialize them so that they associate from early in their lives. Humans, they pet me, that makes me happy. So when they grow up and become mommies, oh, humans, they pet me, I'm happy. Whoop, there we go, let's have some milk. <laughs> Yay, let down. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. So Flora was asking about, did they feed a lot of grain and when was hay a concept? Um, precisely when hay was a concept, I don't know. Uh, it was a concept certainly by the 14th century. Um, I've seen it then. Uh, the early stuff that I looked at going through and looking at Colonella's stuff, which was, uh, which puts us towards the, uh, towards the, uh, the first century, I believe, uh, that will go through and, uh, 
uh, blah, blah, blah. In that, they, they raised them fairly extensively. So they took them out and they sent them out grazing. That's that advantage of that large fermentation vat is you've got animals that can produce quite a bit of feed on uh, what's really kind of almost inferior forage compared to uh, something that is a hind gut fermenter because they are very, very efficient at converting things. So within period, there wasn't quite the need. Um, modern breeds, we do it a little bit differently, but even within the cases where they were, where they're talking about bringing them in and tethering them in tie cells at night, they're sending them out to graze in the daytime. And that seems to be where they're getting the bulk of their forage. Uh, Arwen had a question about So for the bits I've looked at, and I haven't actually looked in England, when I'm, most of my familiarity, there was a question about, uh, do we see an evolution for different breeds to make more meat and animal throughout the period? Uh, I have seen that within the chickens, uh, and we definitely see a selection of that, but it's very regional for where they do it. Within England, most of the work that I've looked at actually is talking about cattle as draft animals. Um, and so meat production is not a large thing. And I'm not seeing the same, the same regionalization and selection in the pieces of the literature that I've looked at. Um, but it's, it's possible it's out there. If there's one thing I've learned about doing animal science research, you know, when you, when you start to talk about the whole world in two to, th two to 3,000 centuries, somebody almost <laughs> did it somewhere, but not something I've tripped across yet. Um, um, I know the, oh, sorry. I know that in some of the um, Italian cooking texts, they are pretty specific that beef is not a, um, it's a very low class meat. So it could be that we're seeing a little bit, a little bit less focus on it as a meat if it is not something that is bred to be a tasty food and it's only used when it's a necessity food. Yeah, and that's, that's a, and one of the things that I think that probably goes with that from the Italian work is I think maybe they worked their cattle before. I, I don't think they were taking prime steers that are two years old and marbled like we do. I think that when they're talking about beef, they may very well be talking about much older animals um, that are a little tougher and, and maybe not so much what we would be used to eating and thinking of. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was, that, that's, that's what I was going to comment on. It was oxen that had aged out of their jobs. Yeah. And there, there are specific references to eating um, uh, female cattle that have aged out of their job as well. Whereas there's there would be a, a fair amount of veal because that's a byproduct of the dairy yeah. industry. And that's something that would have would have been thought to be a little more tender. And, and you will find that in the recipes mm -hmm. as well. Uh, there's a question about, is there any incidence of mammary tumor, tumors in ruminants? Yes, there is. Um, I assume we're talking about modernly. I have, it's not something I've run across in the period work, but again, most of my looking at the venery stuff has been on the horse side. So, and they don't have the same references. So, good. Did we have any other questions? Um, a comment, uh, just particularly for anybody in on tier, um, my cousinlets, have not yet done it, but their business plan for at some point in the next couple of years is to start ranching reindeer, including for their milk, Ooh. as well as meat, as well as meat and horn and so on. But yeah, there hopefully will be a reindeer milk supplier in the Portland area at some point in the next couple of years. That'll be cool. That'll be very cool. That's that's certainly one of the challenges when it comes to sourcing some of these alternate milks is sometimes we've got routes where we can get the meat either from our friends who hunt or something like that, but we don't always have the, the commercial setups to get the different types of milks and certainly not in the sorts of volumes that are convenient if you're making cheese. So, so I had another question um, about the elk versus <laughs> moose. Um, so, mm -hmm. so European medieval elk are North American moose. Is that correct? Okay, okay. Because that's correct. Because here in the Outlands we have elk, and we have people that yes. 
Yes, and we have people going out and hunting elk and you know putting it in feasts and stuff, which is all delicious and good and wonderful. Um, but we don't have moose, <laughs> so. <laughs> so the yeah the the equivalent that I would see for those, um, at least from the French literature, looking at like Gaston Phoebus and Master of Game, what we would what Servid uh, Cadenensis, I think, is the Latin name for the the various strain the various subspecies of North American elk. Uh, those are stags. When we talk about stag hunts and the white stag, and that's a North American elk. Okay. That's the closest comparison. Okay. They are gigantic. Just enormous. Yeah, but, but so are moose. <laughs> yes, but they're bigger than moose, apparently. So from what I understand, I haven't seen it side no. by side. No, the other way moose, around. Moose, moose are big. Moose and it's been are a huge. worth it for a while. Moose are big. <laughs> Moose, yeah. moose, you hit a moose. You hit a moose in in Canada, which happens quite often around where I live. Mm -hmm. Um, you're 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 letting you're. It's like hitting a. It's like hitting a concrete block. Oh, that's the same with elk. Yeah, yeah and elks are the same. Um, we have those as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but like a moose is more like two thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. So like I mean of meat yeah. and not not including the bones, right? Uh -huh. so, I mean, significant protein variation from that perspective, so. Yeah, a yeah. friend of mine, who, a friend who used to live in Alaska, one of his college jobs was driving a tour bus. And, you know, tour buses, there's not a lot of stuff between the, the driver and whatever the bus might hit, mm -hmm. um, except for the steering column. They were told, he was told, at all costs, do not hit a moose because you will drive the steering column through your body and die. Oof. Because moose is that heavy yeah. that it, you know, a bus hits it, they're both dead. It's not that just well, moose is dead. It'll yeah. kill the bus too. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the moose might walk away from that. Yeah, actually. Um, the moose moose might are more away. likely to walk away from being hit by a transport truck than the transport truck is to be able to drive away. Yeah. I mean, not every moose, but some moose, no. they're crazy. So they're beautiful. So I want to briefly, briefly address uh, Lita's question before it travels too far up the chat for me. And then we can go back to talk about moose. Um, I'm a big fan of moose, but that's another story for those that you don't know me. Um, but Lita, you, you asked about Tuari. Um, One of the common things was, at least within the California butcher shops, because it depends on how good your, your butcher shop is, um, tongue would be a common one that we would run across. Um, you may see udder. That would be something that could reasonably be processed. My my local butcher shop's a little a little uh, specialty. We've got all sorts of things. Um, and then the other thing would be the uh, large intestine can see some use in sausage making, where you can find it. Uh, I think there are some things there specifically talk about packing into beef bung. Uh, that would be the large intestine, which. We didn't talk about it because it's not as interesting as the rumen, um, but but that's part of there too. Uh, and then obviously all the muscle meats that would go along there and oxtail, which is the the backbone, the, the last few bones of the uh, spinal column. So and the interesting um, cuts for those of, of critters, I find more often in ethnic butchers. You may have a language yeah. difficulty, um, and so they're yeah, but udders and other things you can find in in my neighborhood in the carnicerias but try your ethnic bushers yeah. they have they have more interesting things <laughs> the the other thing is if you do have a a specialty uh book uh, the structures of the room and so the big one that i'm familiar with in terms of becoming food modernly or that i've seen in the store tripe is the only one. So, so the reticulum is the only one that I've actually seen in the store. There was, let me go ahead and do a quick screen share for you guys, because there's this one image where, hopefully we won't go too far back on this. There we go. So looking at this, structure this this definitely looks like there's a bit of offal to me that's here in the marketplace and then we're also looking at bits and pieces of intestine um, from the way it's drawn 
I'm not completely confident about which species that was. Uh, so, but you can see that they actually, in period, they did go through and have, uh, they did go through and in their meat markets, they had a variety of offal that could be purchased as well. And then down here, we have some more, some more of the stuffed and finished sausages, so. Did that, that get to a little, oh, for you a little bit better, Flita? And cheek, cheek is another one somebody listed. Um, bits and pieces of the head, there was a, a whole head that was in that image as well. Um, I don't know if you'd have an easy time finding a whole head, but if you do have a good butcher shop, um, we have a, a great little tiny meat store in town that's known for their sausage making. They, they sometimes have some interesting things in the freezer case. They're also really good if I go to them and say I'm specifically looking for X, they'll find that. The other thing that we have in our area is we have a uh, small beef processing plant that has a store in the front. Um, if you have access to some of those small ones, uh, we've got folks from Ontario. I know there are some in the Portland area. Um, sometimes they can't do out the door sales, but occasionally they can, or they might be able to work with a local butcher to you. It depends on how their licensure works on being able to get you bits and pieces. Um, they may have to sell it to you labeled not for human consumption. Uh, that's what happens with chicken feet typically in the US. But but you can go through and get your hands on those those things when you go to the ethnic places, the small butchers, or directly to the um, processing plants. So. Perfect. Ah, there we go. Nice day. Do we have any any more questions from anyone? No, I think we got it. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Uh, yeah, we can go Thank ahead you, and Elsie. end the recording. Absolutely. Ilador, I'll get I'll add you into 